¿Empezamos ya entonces? Yes. Sí, empezamos. Vale, el PowerPoint entonces lo compartirán desde otro lado, ¿no? Vamos a intentarlo compartir nosotros. Vale, pues eh, empiezo a grabar yo también y subo la música. Ok. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I am MS Gertrude Oferua Fairfamer from Ghana, a World Blind Union Executive Committee member, a CRPD Committee member. I work at site service and above all, I'm a good friend and supporter of the World Blind Union. My dear friends and colleagues, I, welcome, I warmly welcome you to this webinar. I hope you are keeping safe. We are today going to discuss disability and intersectionality, joint efforts in promoting full inclusion. I'm so grateful for your time and the opportunity to moderate this high level discussion on disability and society and our own joint efforts for full inclusion. With friends, intersectional discrimination occurs when a person with disability experiences discrimination based on his or her disability, and in addition, based on other grounds such as gender, race, age, among others. So for instance, all the women with disabilities, they face intersecting forms of discrimination. Gender address issues, having included them, but not in the manner inconsistent with human rights. And this perpetuates the multiple forms of discrimination. And this is experienced by many women and girls in the community of blind and partial sightedness. Unfortunately, it is not only in the mainstream women rights movement and, and issues that blind and partially sighted women and girls experience occasion, but also within the disability rights movement. So this is what this is the setting up of the Women's Blind Union Women's Committee in the early 90s. And I would add that as far back as 1981 in Ghana, for example, we established the Women's Committee. And I have been privileged to be part of this journey until now. Intersecting forms of discrimination faced by blind and partially sighted women and women and girls' disabilities in general require influencing both by research that should effect changes in policies, programs, activities, in consultation with women and girls' disabilities, and our representative organizations. As you may know, 
There are some legislations back in the Lagos Assista chapter, the CRPD, and his general comments, the SDGs provisions, Generation Equality Forum, and its um, action collation processes. And there are also continental processes. We therefore need to intensify our advocacy. And today's high level discussion is one of the opportunities. We are taking advantage of today to continue raising our voices. Disability, sectionality, joining efforts and talking about joint efforts of full inclusion. With the presence of high level experts, that we have today. I will now invite Professor Kismila Tabali. She is a world the Libya Women's Committee member and an activist in India. And she works on the rights of women and girls with disabilities. So Professor conducted a research in India about women and intersectionality. And this research has been approved by the WB Women's Committee far back in May. So Professor, you have the floor for your presentation for 15 minutes. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Ruth. Good Honorable moderator, Distinguished delegates from many countries. I'm going to present a paper, Disability and Intersectionality, Joint Efforts in Promoting Full Inclusion. My uh, slide begins with, what is intersectionality? People are complex and multifaceted with many interwoven attributes making up their identity. Disability is just one part of a person's identity that may shape, but not define them. The term intersectionality has broadened to include all protected characteristics such as class, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, religion, disability, gender, etc. It's the idea that these layers do not exist separately from each other, but intersect to form a person's identity and can magnify the discrimination and marginalization they might experience. My slide third, you can see. When to use intersectionality? When the following questions arise, one must take a survey and formulate reports to assess the situation and consider intersectionality as your go-to model of thinking and doing. Which communities are served and which are not why? Who gets to participate and who does not? Why? Who has access to resources and support and who does not? Why? Whose voices get heard and whose do not? Why? Slide four. Why disability and intersectionality are needed to be discussed. To demonstrate the 
importance of intersectionality let us take an example of two blind people say sara and sita sita is a blind upper class heterosexual woman while sara is a blind muslim woman who is lesbian by sexual orientation the discriminations exist everywhere even sita is a marginal person who will be discriminated but sara's life journey will be far more difficult for the for she will be discriminated on multiple levels for instance people who suffer from islamophobia will ill treat her people who are not comfortable with blindness or lgbtqi plus identity will treat her differently additionally being a woman is not easy either and so on so forth in order to effectively support people's lives experiences and make these world a more egalitarian space it is vital to discuss this very issue these discussions can positively impact on widening participation goals in social personal and workplace environment they may result in boosting productivity well being and mental health by finding applicable laws amendments policies etc this dialogue can help creating a positive cultural shift towards increased acceptance of diverse learning styles resulting in improved accessibility and inclusion my slide 5 says laws legislation amendments and global efforts the crpd and the cdo both address access to justice and legal rights article 15 of cdo focuses on legal autonomy requiring states to ensure equal rights of men and women before the law while the crpd draws on this concept to ensure the capacity to be a person before the law and legal capacity to act the millennium development goals created by the united nations in 2000 represented a serious global effort to make an impact on poverty by the year 2015 however none of the eight goals 21 targets or 60 indicators refers referenced people with disabilities the absence of people with disabilities in the mdgs 
was extremely concerning as statistics at that time estimated that 10% of the world's population was living with disability with disabilities made up a disproportionate amount of the world's poor the lack of inclusion in such a serious global effort to attack poverty persons or only a missed opportunity but a restriction on the ability to achieve the mdgs without addressing the needs of people with disabilities learning from this lesson the 2015 sustainable sustainable development goals sdgs made considerable efforts to be more inclusive five of the sdgs goals 4 8 10 11 and 17 included people with disabilities the phrase people with disabilities or the word disability itself was mentioned 11 times this inclusion marks a considerable change in the global effort to eradicate poverty moving forward global efforts to achieve these goals will need to incorporate an equally strong inclusion of people with disabilities a pursuit of a four mention international treaties clearly reveals that lgbtqai plus within the disability or as a broad sub category slash category do not find place in the provisions of those treaties since i belong to india legal position as it exists for this group would be in order at this juncture like uncrpd and cdo rights of persons with disabilities act 2016 recognizes the rights of women with disabilities both for the purposes of inclusion and empowerment but since there is no mention of this group which face the gender identity crisis it could be safely concluded that there is no legislative mandate specially for their inclusion in spite of this legislative and policy vacuum our apex court has recognized the rights of the group in a landmark judgment 
in the year of 2014 ruling thus units apart from the binary gender be treated as a third gender for the purpose of safeguarding their rights under our constitution and the laws made by parliament and states legislature recognition of transgender as third gender is not a social or medical issue but a human right issue transgenders are also citizen of india the spirit of the constitution is to provide equal opportunity to every citizen to grow and attain their potential irrespective of caste religion or gender gender identification is essential it is only with this recognition that many rights such as the right to vote own property and marry will be meaningful finally the bench in order to ensure inclusion of this group in the community life directed the center and states to take steps to treat them as socially and educationally backward classes and ex extend reservation for admission in educational institutions and for public appointments thus this historic verdict of the apex court having force of law has initiated the process of lifting stigma attached to this group because of gender identity crisis and paved the way for their inclusion in poverty disability functions in dangerous way 14% of the world's population lives with a disability over a billion the disability rights fund states that 80% of this number live in developing countries and make up 20% of the poorest of the poor who live on less than 1 dollar per day poverty and disability have a mutually destructive relationship disability causes poverty and poverty causes disability on the sixth slide a few example of economic and financial positions shared by the disabled people across the world are given 
I can share this data with you through email. I have already demonstrated in the slide. UNDP sustainability goals, disability and intersectionality, poverty, disability and gender intersect to impact the way that violence affects women with disabilities. Negative public attitudes towards and fears about disability. Women and the queer people with disabilities are generally not believed when reporting or disclosing abuse. Social isolation and increased the risk of manipulation, lack of support for caregivers, limited or no education about appropriate and inappropriate sexuality, physical helplessness and vulnerability in public places, lack of safe affordability and reliable alternatives in terms of shelter, services and care, basic necessities, lack of education or technological support, technological access, lack of access to information about protective legislations, denial of human rights, resulting in perceptions of powerlessness. Internalized oppressive beliefs and socialization to be compliant, fear of losing their children, fear of being ostracized from the their community, family, distrust, and lack of confidence in the police. High I have so many small. dependency. What you said? We have too many small for you, please, to round off. OK. So I have already you. showed you in the slides. Thanks for giving me so much time. But with, uh, I will like to say that uh, WBU and ICVI, like organize, international organization, can give some space to this group in their programs, activities, and can start a good beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. You have brought to bear in a clear manner, expanded for us what intersectionality is, giving typical examples and relevant, citing ones from India as well as global. You have also brought to us the gaps that exist, some of which are typical, such as the 
the legal issues that need to be addressed and the capacity we need to have, the gaps of education, lack of service such as a sheltered and attention to our systems. You really said a lot and said it much. So I can only say thank you. And I know we have questions close to what you have suggested or maybe further away because your experience is a lot. We thank you. Before I go to the next speaker, I would want to encourage, um, let the technical team to support us. I understand one of our panelists is, is on the participant team instead of being on the partners. So if we need any assistance to let Benatila join us. While this is being done, I would want to introduce MS Patricia Sans Kayo. She is the third, uh, sorry, on says third vice president. And she will be presenting on equality, digital inclusion, and gender. May those who are not speaking please unmute so that we can have clearer sound. Madam Patricia, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Gertrude, y encantada de estar aquí con las casi 80 personas que hay conectadas y con todas aquellas personas que nos puedan escuchar eh, después, gracias a que, a que se va a grabar la sesión. Y manifestar también que estoy encantada de poder compartir mesa tanto con Donatella como con la profesora Kumsun Lata, quien acabamos de, de escuchar. Bueno, pues yo coincido plenamente con la ponente anterior en el comienzo de su intervención y refuerzo la idea que ella compartía con los presentes en cuanto a que la discapacidad es una característica más de las personas, pero por desgracia suele ser bastante frecuente que es la característica que casi en exclusiva se ve de las personas que tenemos discapacidad o al menos la que más se percibe y la que más connotaciones tiene y en lo que voy a comentar a continuación vinculado fundamentalmente con el acceso y permanencia en el mercado laboral tiene consecuencias que, que efectivamente pues limitan la autonomía económica y la autonomía de vida de las personas con discapacidad y de la familia que constituyen esas personas y lo voy a relacionar eh, teniendo en cuenta la interseccionalidad que nos trae hoy a esta mesa, voy a relacionar la variable de discapacidad con la variable de género, en concreto con, eh, voy a hablar de las mujeres con discapacidad, pero también voy a poner algún ejemplo de alguna otra variable que también tiene mayores consecuencias en la medida en que dos o más variables interactúan. Bueno, desde mi punto de vista, lo primero para poder sacar conclusiones es tener una radiografía, en este caso, de cómo están las personas con discapacidad en España, de cuántas son, de cómo acceden al mercado laboral y de si en la medida que le vayamos añadiendo variables a las personas con discapacidad, que en este caso le añadimos la variable de género, pues ese acceso, como decía, al trabajo es o no más difícil. Y vamos a ponerle cifras porque también creo que en la medida en la que tengamos datos objetivos y contrastables podemos ir viendo cómo evolucionan cada año o periódicamente e ir viendo cómo podemos incidir con las políticas que se pongan en marcha para que esos datos mejoren, que es lo que perseguimos al final todas las organizaciones que estamos hoy aquí. Las personas con discapacidad en España son casi 4 millones. Y de ellas, más del 50% son mujeres. Hasta aquí un dato objetivo, contrastable, que no tiene interpretación. Casi 4 millones de personas y más del 50% mujeres. Lo cual es un reflejo de la sociedad española, porque más del 50% de la sociedad general española son mujeres. 
si hablamos de personas con discapacidad que están en edad de poder trabajar, constituyen el 6,2% de la población general con y sin discapacidad que están en edad de trabajar, lo cual también es un porcentaje importante, pero luego veremos si se traduce en esa misma proporción cuando hablamos ya de inclusión laboral de las personas con discapacidad. De ese porcentaje de personas con discapacidad en edad de trabajar, casi el 57% son mujeres. Es decir, hay más mujeres con discapacidad en edad de trabajar que mujeres con discapacidad en otras franjas de edad, o por ser menores o por ser mayores. Sin embargo, y aquí ya empezamos a enlazar los datos que tenemos con las posibles causas que lo provocan. En el año 2019, que es el año del que tenemos ya datos eh, cerrados, solo el 1,6% de todos los contratos que se produjeron en España fueron destinados a personas con discapacidad. Si recuerdan, hemos dicho que el 6,2% de la población española en edad de trabajar tiene discapacidad y sin embargo, lejos de ese 6,2%, solo el 1,6% tuvo oportunidad de incorporarse al mercado laboral en 2019. Aquí ya hay un primer dato con conclusión. No estamos en igualdad de oportunidades las personas con discapacidad, siendo difícil para todos hoy en día y más en este momento a causa de la pandemia acceder a un trabajo. Pero ni de lejos las personas con discapacidad accedemos en una proporción similar a las personas sin discapacidad. Vamos a añadirle, y aquí ya hablamos de intersección, la variable de género. Las mujeres con discapacidad en ese mismo año, 2019, solo accedieron al 38% del total de contratos destinados a personas con discapacidad. Por lo tanto, desigualdad de acceso al mercado laboral de las personas con discapacidad sin incluir el género. Si lo incluimos, es decir, intersección, solo el 38% de ellos fueron destinados a mujeres con discapacidad. Si bien, si recuerdan, en esa edad de trabajar, casi el 57% de la población con discapacidad son mujeres. ¿Por qué siendo más accedemos significativamente menos? Y aquí es donde debemos empezar a hacernos preguntas para a continuación ver cómo nosotros podemos contribuir a reducir esa brecha y a buscar soluciones. Hay una mayor protección quizá de las familias a las mujeres con discapacidad, seguro. Además, las mujeres con discapacidad, como las mujeres en general, accedemos más tarde al mercado laboral. Es por una buena causa y es porque accedemos a una formación superior que la de los hombres. Pero la consecuencia es que trabajamos menos años y por lo tanto nuestra vida laboral es menor y nuestra pensión por jubilación posterior también. Estamos más y mejor formadas, pero accedemos más tarde al mercado laboral, cobraremos menos, que ahora lo veremos también, y por lo tanto la pensión que percibimos después es menor, lo cual se traduce en que contribuimos menos. Y no por falta de ganas ni de esfuerzo, pero contribuimos menos a la economía y contribuimos menos a nuestra propia familia. Y esa es una brecha importante que corregir. De hecho, en nuestro país, España, hoy en día, solo una de cada cuatro personas con discapacidad trabaja. Solo un 25% de las personas con discapacidad. A pesar de haber casi 4 millones, a pesar de haber... Muchas personas con discapacidad, con edad, ganas, formación y habilidades para poder hacerlo. ¿Qué está pasando? Por tanto, hay mucho desconocimiento del empresariado de este país y mucho recelo todavía a contratar a personas con discapacidad. Seguro que lo hay, pero eso no puede justificar una tasa de desempleo tan alta. Además, hay leyes que dicen que las empresas que tienen al menos 50 trabajadores en plantilla tienen que tener un 2% de personas con discapacidad en esa plantilla. 
pero no todas lo cumplen. Ahí hay una clara mejora por delante para seguir concienciando y sensibilizando a la sociedad y vigilando también por el cumplimiento de la ley. Si hablamos de la tasa de ocupación y nos comparamos con las personas sin discapacidad, quienes la tenemos, las personas con discapacidad en este país, respondemos a una tasa de ocupación del 25%. Esa una de cada cuatro personas con discapacidad solo trabaja en nuestro país. Sin embargo, y aquí vamos a hablar también de intersección y de cómo afecta al género. Las mujeres sin discapacidad en el mismo país, en el mismo momento, tienen una tasa de ocupación del 61%, casi dos veces y media más que las personas, hombres y mujeres, ambos, que las personas sin discapacidad. Pero es que los hombres sin discapacidad en el mismo país, en el mismo momento, tienen una tasa de ocupación del 73%, lo cual es muy superior al 25% de las personas con discapacidad. Además, hay una mayor temporalidad en la forma de contratación de las personas con discapacidad. Se nos contrata para puestos más operativos, para puestos de soporte administrativo. Y realizamos muchos más contratos al cabo del año y en jornadas parciales no completas. Y eso, una vez más, también afecta negativamente a la retribución. En concreto, las mujeres con discapacidad cobramos de media al año un 15,9% menos que los hombres con discapacidad. Ambos tenemos discapacidad aquí. Cuando la discapacidad interactúa con el género, claramente nos perjudica. Somos el colectivo peor remunerado, las mujeres con discapacidad. Nosotras, además, percibimos al año un 14,9% que las mujeres menos que las mujeres sin discapacidad. Aquí el género es el mismo, pero es la discapacidad la que juega en nuestra contra. Y las mujeres con discapacidad en retribución percibimos más de un 33% menos que los hombres sin discapacidad. Por tanto, la discapacidad es una variable que es una barrera clara para acceder todavía hoy en día al mercado laboral. Es una barrera que afecta a la retribución. Pero si le sumamos la variable de género, las mujeres con discapacidad accedemos más tarde al mercado laboral a pesar de estar más formadas no accedemos a puestos de trabajo más cualificados a pesar de estar más formadas por el peso de la discapacidad y además tenemos una retribución significativamente inferior. Pero hecha esta radiografía no, nos, no quisiera transmitir solo pesimismo, es una radiografía que evidentemente no es buena, pero ¿cómo podemos cada uno de nosotros contribuir para que la situación mejore? Voy a contarles algunos ejemplos en los que estamos trabajando desde el Grupo Social 11 y hay otros muchos, afortunadamente. Yo les voy a contar los que conozco y en los que estamos trabajando. En el Grupo Social 11 trabajamos 70.000 personas, hombres y mujeres, con y sin discapacidad. En la 11, en Fundación 11 y en su grupo empresarial Ilunion. De esas 70.000 personas, el 58% tiene discapacidad. Si nosotros podemos, los demás también. Quizá no haya que llegar a ese 58%, ojalá sí, pero ¿cómo no se va a poder llegar al 2% que contempla la ley? De esas 70.000 personas, el 42,6% somos mujeres, nos preocupa la igualdad de oportunidades y velamos para que en los puestos o en las unidades donde todavía no hay equilibrio entre género, lo haya. Una de cada 279 personas que tiene la suerte de trabajar en España lo hace con nosotros. Y eso es lo que nos hace sentir orgullosos. Somos un generador de empleo para personas con y sin discapacidad. Somos el cuarto mayor empleador no público de este país. ¿En qué eh, estamos trabajando para fomentar la incorporación de más mujeres y especialmente con discapacidad a nuestra plantilla? Hay un proyecto que se llama Venta con Talento en Femenino. Nosotros 
La ONCE tiene casi 19.000 personas vendiendo productos de lotería responsable en la calle que permiten prestar servicios sociales de manera gratuita a las personas con ceguera y deficiencia visual y que ayudan al resto de la discapacidad no visual a eliminar barreras. Pues esas casi 19.000 personas queremos que sean hombres y mujeres. Mujeres, actualmente hay casi 5.500, pero queremos que haya más porque hay un desequilibrio que corregir. Y eso es lo que persigue este proyecto de venta con talento en femenino. Estamos trabajando para contar nuestro mensaje de manera que también las mujeres con discapacidad de este país, que viven en este país, no tienen por qué ser solo de este país, sepan que la oportunidad laboral es para todos, para ellos y para ellas. Y es una forma muy digna de ganarse la vida y de tener un sueldo fijo con comisiones variables cada mes. Otro proyecto de nuestro grupo empresarial, Ilunion es para ti, que persigue incorporar mujeres especialmente con discapacidad en sectores que al menos en España están muy masculinizados. El sector de la automoción, el sector industrial, el sector de la vigilancia, nuevamente oportunidades laborales que ya están y que necesitan incorporar a personas, pues queremos corregir el desequilibrio que hoy en día existe e incorporar a más mujeres con discapacidad. Un tercer proyecto que se llama Women in Tech. Nosotros creemos que los proyectos que tienen nombre atraen la atención y atraen talento y por eso procuramos ponerles nombres a todos. Women in Tech persigue incorporar a mujeres con discapacidad con habilidades tecnológicas para que sean referentes de otras mujeres que se puedan incorporar posteriormente a la plantilla. Para eso hemos formado a más de 50 mujeres de todas las edades con discapacidad en esas habilidades tecnológicas a través de un programa que también en este caso tiene un nombre propio y se llama Radio. Fomentamos a través de Fundación 11 la contratación interna y externa de mujeres con discapacidad víctimas de violencia de género. Porque si difícil lo tiene cualquier mujer que es víctima de violencia de género, más difícil aún lo tiene cuando la discapacidad está presente. Teniendo en cuenta además que en muchos casos, más de los que nos gustaría, la discapacidad Ahora, Patricia, es consecuencia... Ok, thank you. La discapacidad es consecuencia de esa situación de violencia de género. El año pasado en nuestro grupo empresarial se contrató a 64 mujeres con discapacidad víctimas de violencia de género. Externamente conseguimos que el empresariado de este país contratara a más de 200 mujeres con discapacidad con violencia de género. Y también tenemos programas, decía antes, no solo voy a analizar el cruce de la, de la variable de discapacidad con género, también la edad juega aquí un papel complicado a la hora de incorporarse al mercado laboral, porque la discapacidad, al sí, menos en Patricia, España, cada vez, eh, okay, cada vez es más sobrevenida y viene a se genera a consecuencia de accidentes laborales o de tráfico, y no es fácil. Encontrar trabajo siendo mujer a los 50 años con una discapacidad reciente. También en ese programa estamos trabajando. Muchísimas gracias a todos y a todas y a su disposición para contestar después a las preguntas que surjan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madame Patricia, for such a presentation. The statistics that comes with it, making it very realistic. The experience and the emphasis on work, the, the comparison, it's very alive and very true. And I'm sure many of our audience are energized. And what I won't go without mentioning is that, yes, there are issues but there are success stories. It took a bit of time to share some of us with us too. That is very enlightening, thank you. And because you talked about employment, I would want to take a minute to say that the CRPD committee 
is engaging in a process of a general comment on work and employment. And by September, October, the drafts will be on the CRPD website. Now, I encourage all of us to have a look, particularly to deepen and strengthen the gender issues inside of that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So now we'll go to global. We've done India, we've done Spain, and now we'll come to global. Our next speaker is Emes Rasila Kalimba. She is the World Blind Union's second vice president and the chair of the WBU Women's Committee. And my good friend Rasila will share with us the work of the WBU Women's Committee during the term 2016 to 2021. And Donna, please, we have 15 minutes. Thank you and take the floor. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, dear moderator. Uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, throughout the world, through all time zones, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And some people, it's in the middle of the night. I'm very happy. Uh, to have this opportunity uh, to speak to all of you about the work of the uh, Women's Committee in the WBU. I was the second vice president and the chairperson of the Women's Committee uh, in the past quadrennium, but we've already held um, our General Assembly we are the outgoing now. So um, I would like to talk about the work of the Women's Committee, but also to say something about what it inspires me to think and what we should be looking forward to or doing to continue the change that we initiated. Um, when I took up, uh, when I took on the work of uh, chairperson of the Women's Committee, as I was reading through past reports uh, to, to get myself into the field of the work, I came across uh, this um, statement or this theme from a women's network meeting that had taken place in 2015. That is when Dr. Penny Hartin was the uh, CEO and there was a different women's uh, committee chair whom I can't quite remember. It said something like, working with our feet, family on, family on the ground and our hands reaching high. I think this very clearly expresses the feel and the theme of the women's, uh, the WBU Women's Committee. When it first started in the 1990s, it was being called the Committee on the Status of Blind Women. I joined. Um, the executive committee in uh, 2017, after the sudden uh, passing away of Dr. Eli Macha, uh, who was the second vice president at the time. But soon after that also, the chairperson of the women's committee, Ms. Uh, Kathy Donaldson, um, resigned from her position and I took up the the work of the Women's Committee as well. Looking at the reports, I found that there was a wonderful trend that was running through all the reports that I read. They spoke of 
um, blind women's struggles, their strengths, their resilience, their high ambitions, and powerful resolve to stay with their heads held up high. Because in all the reports, what you found was that they have challenges, but there is something they have done uh, to overcome these challenges. Uh, the Women's Committee, I took over in uh, 2017, 2018, had, had held quite a number of online uh, meetings or teleconferences. And that's the way we continued, especially, uh, particularly due to probably um, financial constraints because we couldn't meet that often face to face. So we had teleconferences, Skype or Zoom meetings and we had only one face-to-face -face meeting, um, which was held in Athens, Greece uh, in 2019. To live, up, to live up to our belief in diversity, the committee included both uh, young and uh, older women or the meeting rather, included both older and younger women because uh, the women's, the youth were represented by a young woman. Although of course we had other young women in the committee, but they were not specifically or expressly representing youth. So there was one woman who came uh, to, re to represent the youth. Uh, reports from the uh, regions also showed that our national member organizations do not leave behind the younger women because we did get some reports that spoke of uh, activities involving youth and particularly young women or, or girls including advocacy work on behalf of um, education uh, for girls with visual impairments. The, the WBU Women's Committee, um, during this quadrennium also initiated uh, two major activities Uh, which specifically uh, wanted to show the situation of women and to empower women with visual, empowerment, uh, visual impairments. There was a survey on the situation of blind women or women with visual impairment, which was uh, mass massively responded to and its findings are available on the WBU website. There were over 500 uh, respo respondents in all languages used in the WBU and from all um, the regions. It generated some very useful information which can be used in advocacy and in planning for improvements or for interventions that uh, will lead to improvements. Uh, in this, in this uh, survey, it was revealed that while the situation of women uh, with visual impairments is still very dire in some countries, and even being made more difficult by the many conflicts that are taking place in different parts of the world, there is a window of opportunity 
because both the UNCRPD and the Sustainable Development Goals address themselves to persons with disabilities and to the issues of women. As long as there is somebody, uh, there is uh, and something addressing issues of women, and this is a window of opportunity for us uh, to be able to advocate for our rights. The Women's Committee also initiated uh, the Women's Empowerment Award. Which was proposed during the 2016 General Assembly in Orlando, Florida. The first winner of the award shall be announced in this uh, General Assembly. Um, the Empowerment Award, uh, I mean, the Women's Committee took quite some time to develop uh, the terms of reference for the, the woman uh, to be nominated for the Empowerment Award. And the nomination uh, form, which was circulated, and a committee was formed to select the winner. So this work has been done. Much of it had to be done uh, online because of uh, the interferences with COVID-19. It is my hope that it will encourage uh, the blind women to stand with their feet firmly on the ground and to speak for themselves to make sure that they are not left behind. Speaking out for women uh, with visual impairment or for blind women involves all ages. It does not involve only women active uh, in employment or but women- two minutes more, please. Or women engaged in education but all women. According to the UNCRPD, the world should view uh, disability from a rights point of view. It is the right of every child to live within the family. And it is also the right of every individual to live within the family. This means that um, parents of children with disabilities or with visual impairment ought to be encouraged and supported to bring up their children, guiding them towards being independent. Governments should be uh, having ways to support or strategies to support parents to uh, help their children to learn to be Madam. independent. Please, Madam, so, two minutes more. Thank yes, you. Yes, um, I will try to shorten. So I would uh, thank you. Re recommend that the WBU members to be more concrete in talking about gender and how our disability affects us and our gender roles as blind parents, blind women who are bringing up children as women with visual impairment who are going through the world. Also, to conclude, um, we should stand together, not leaving all the work to national organizations. It is true that our different cultures mean that we are affected differently uh, in the way we, um, in the way we operate in our societies, but it means that we, we, we should stand together and support each other. And that is why we had to come together in worldwide organizations, whether WBU, whether ICEVI, or any other international organizations so that we can address ourselves 
to the world for changes that support women with visual impairment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madame Donatilla, for this expressive and illustrative presentation. We have come to appreciate where the committee started its work from, continued in the era. And I cannot agree any better than the fact that we need to collaborate, we need to network, we need to strengthen ourselves in order to make the impact we are continuously working towards. Thank you very much. We don't have much time left, but there's a few questions. And uh, there is one that I, would, I can answer. So with the permission of the Natila, I think I'll answer that. The question, the question is whether the Blue Women's Committee is a separate organization. No. The WDU Women's Committee is a subcommittee of World Blind Union. So there is a phenomenon that World Blind Union started, and that is why I appreciate where Donatilla ended, that together we are stronger. You would have also heard across all the speakers, among all the speakers, how important it is that within our disability movement, women initiatives are strengthened. So World Blind Union came up with the phenomenon of not separating the women's work so that we can get allies among the men, we can influence the men as well. And so we can be a stronger organization of men and women working together to improve the well-being of all by the women's committee with a focus on women and girls. There is another question, it comes to Professor. And I'm checking the time so we can think of how much. I think we could do that in five minutes. It would, it would be very nice. Where um, somebody wants to know about the situation in India with the focus, I mean, women and girls in India with the focus on education and employment. And what else World Blind Union could do? Thank you, Professor. You have the floor for five minutes. What I'm missing. Professor, please, you have a question. Somebody wants to know about the situation in India regarding women and girls in education and employment and what WBU can do to promote this agenda. You have five minutes, please. Thank you, Professor. Hello? Am I audible? Hello? Yes, please. Please, you are. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, WBU can... Current situation of India is... Uh, separated. There are two segments of uh, blind women. One uh, is educated and rural in rural area there is no education for blind women especially who are uneducated they don't have access of resources but who have the access of resources they are in good conditions they are in good positions uh, in educated blind women there is around 48% have jobs 
and uh, 52% seeking jobs but it is very difficult to get a job without reservation they can't hold private job and uh, with the help of the reservation they can get job only but day by day privatization privatization is uh, increasing and uh, government jobs programs some activities like for our uh, rural uh, blind sisters we can give them help and in education and health program and along with technical and along with technical support बोला ना कुछ हेलो Are we together, please? Thank you. Um, for the Zada, you you raised your hands. Could you take a minute to ask a question, and to who would answer the question, please? Ian Zada, you have to raise your hand. Could you take a minute to ask a question, please? Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Hello. Buenos dias. Can we hear you? Bueno, hello. Bueno, yes. Diaz. Translation Gracias. is not coming up, please. <laughs> Gracias. Hello. Soy Ines Posada desde Colombia. Mi pregunta es, okay. ¿cómo nos podemos beneficiar acá en Colombia de los tratados internacionales? Y aprovecho para felicitarlos por esta asamblea que está muy interesante. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Unfortunately, I missed the interpretation. I don't know why. But um Please, who did the question go to? The moderator. It came to me, the moderator. Mm -hmm. I, yes. I am the moderator. I missed the interpretation. So panel members, please answer our dear colleague. Who would wish to take the floor to answer? If you can hear me, I can tell you the question. She wondered yes, how- Yes, Zoratila, I can hear you, please. 
Yes, she wondered how uh, they in Colombia can benefit from the international treaties. I said it, it, it should come to the moderator because I know that you have been on the UNCRPD committee. Um, it, will, it will come to the Natila because somebody else have also asked about this question um, to the Natila and about how national action in CRPD. So the Natila, please take and then I'll add on. And then in this, we are coming. So please, the Natila. Thank you very much. Um, for organizations to benefit from the uh, from the international um, treaties, it involves the organizations on the ground uh, getting together and um, advocating uh, to their governments for legislation. To first of all, you um, advocate for your government to sign the treaty. For you to benefit from the treaty, your government will have signed and ratified the treaty. Then you need to get your government to, uh, when they have ratified it, means domesticating, passing legislations uh, that will uh, support full inclusion of persons with disabilities or persons with visual impairment depending on where uh, you see the gap. So for national organizations to benefit from this, um, from the UNCRPD, it will be that your government has signed the UNCRPD. Your government has also signed uh, the optional protocol that goes with the UNCRPD. And that means that they have ratified the UNCRPD. They have accepted to include it in their own law, the national law. And therefore now Thank you, you, can claim, you can claim uh, that your government uh, should be planning for you. There should be education policies that show how people with visual impairment are going to be educated, how people with visual impairment are going to be employed, how there is going to be um, disability mainstreaming that also will mainstream services for persons with visual impairment. Welcome, Yeti. Thank you very much, Donatella. Thank you, the time. So we have only six minutes left, but there's a question for Patricia. So she would help us with it and then she will give her conclusion remark a minute and then we go around. So the question is that, what is your recommendation for women and girls in this audience to promote their rights. Please, Patricia, somebody wants to know this from you. Muchas gracias. Pues eh, fundamentalmente comparto dos o tres ideas. La primera, yo creo que es muy positivo que pueda haber más encuentros como el de hoy con, en otros entornos, con otros marcos de convocatoria pero en los que las distintas organizaciones conozcamos la realidad de las personas y de las mujeres con discapacidad en los distintos países para saber cómo podemos contribuir a mejorar esa realidad, como decía antes. Yo creo que ese trabajo en equipo del que se hablaba antes es fundamental. Podemos hacer muchas más cosas si las hacemos juntas que si cada organización las va haciendo con el mejor conocimiento y con la mejor intención por separado. Entonces, eh, yo dejo sobre la mesa, sobre todo, nuestra disposición como 11, como Grupo Social 11 desde España y con todos los países que estamos aquí reunidos a colaborar en lo que sea necesario, a aprender de las realidades de otros sitios, como se ha compartido hoy aquí, porque eso nos puede enriquecer y nos puede hacer mejorar a nosotros y nos puede hacer mejorar a todos. Y sobre todo, y termino, puede contribuir a generar más oportunidades para todas las mujeres con independencia de la edad, para mejorar su acceso a la educación y a la formación 
en igualdad de oportunidades, para mejorar su acceso al mercado laboral y para que las mujeres mayores, de mayor edad, también puedan seguir reivindicando esa igualdad de oportunidades. El ser una persona mayor, el cumplir años, no evita tener las mismas necesidades, demandas y desigualdades que el resto de las mujeres y creo que eso también es importante, hablar de mujeres jóvenes y mayores y hablar de mujeres como un hándicap adicional que se suma a la variable de la discapacidad. Thank you very much. Yes, we need more of this. And in fact, we need more time because our time is already getting. Elizabeth wants the floor. Elizabeth, if you could take a minute, then our panelists use a minute each to round off while they answer you. Elizabeth Campos. Okay, so if Elizabeth is not ready, can we now use a minute each for our con the last minute, one minute into information, starting from Prof, one minute, Donatilla, one minute, and then Patricia, a minute. Professor. The last minute. Thank you. One thank minute, you, ladies. Conclusion. Uh, thank you, ladies. Thank you, Gertrude. Very wonderful session it was. And we share our views about international and national policies. Thank you very much for giving your so much precious time. Thank you, Professor. Donatilla, your one minute, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was a wonderful time uh, talking to all of you, uh, both ladies and gentlemen. All I would like to call upon you is to take, uh, to take it upon ourselves to move the agenda to, towards a roadmap of being fully inclusive of women and girls uh, with visual impairment and not only just those in school, also mothers uh, with visual impairment. And we must make sure that the agenda goes down to the grassroots, to the women in rural areas. It is incumbent upon us to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Donatilla. Patricia, please. Encantada y muy agradecida de haber podido formar parte de esta mesa y sobre todo, como hacía mi compañera, ¿no? un llamamiento, un llamamiento a que llegue más lejos la voz de la UMC y en concreto las necesidades de las mujeres con independencia de la edad, de las mujeres con discapacidad y que esa voz de la UMC consiga que todas las sociedades con y sin discapacidad le presten atención porque todas las personas podemos tener una discapacidad no tenemos por qué nacer con ella, se puede adquirir después. Y ese mensaje creo que es importante, que algo que a todos nos puede pasar, a todos y a todas nos debe preocupar. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, distinguished experts. You've made this day so memorable. And we thank you for your time. For the audience, Oh, sorry, to the um, panel expert, I'm sorry that I had to interrupt you from time to time. It's not my intention, but the time is running. I also, I also thank all the audience and apologize for those who have more questions that have not been answered. Please send your questions to the secretariat or the organizers of the World Blind Union and we'll do well to answer you. I thank you all for this day and please, there is only a continuation of the agenda. There is a role each and every one of us can play in our homes, in our organization, in our workplaces, in our schools. And it's all, all and all. All hands on deck, we thank you. We thank you for the technical team 
We thank you for our assistance. We thank everybody who has made this day so memorable and remarkable. Please go, with the, go away with the message and let us work harder for the empowerment and full inclusion of women and girls because we are marginalized. But we want to be unmarginalized. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Adiós y hasta la próxima. Bye bye. Until next time.